you're following along with us. Okay, and so I stuck with this most popular, probably most popular passage in the in the Bible because of John three sixteen. And so uh, that first half of this chapter. Now I'm preaching out of the second half, but first half is 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 super popular. There's a lot of great verses. You know, tons of verses in there that you probably already know as he's reading it, like you're quoting along with him. Uh, Brother Austin said that when I asked him to read this, he said, I used to be able to quote the whole thing, but he, had, he didn't have the confidence to do that right now. But because this is a lot of uh, people's favorite chapter, they want to read that. So first half, though, is probably more popular as it talks about John, uh, I mean, as it talks about uh, Nicodemus. Second half is talking about John the Baptist, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning. The title of the message is The Friend of the Bridegroom. Okay, and that's what uh, John the Baptist referred to himself as. <clears throat> Look at verse 36, though. Another great uh, passage of Scripture to memorize this good salvation verse. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. There's so much there just in that one sentence, right? Uh, how do you get it? By believing on Jesus Christ. How long does it last? It's everlasting. Uh, you know, uh, you can you can really get a lot out of this verse. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Interesting. I just talked to. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. Where, I guess it was. Uh, I guess it was Thursday night, probably a Friday night. I can't remember. Friday night. Uh, we talked to this guy on the seventh day of Venice, and uh, he was just making sort of a big deal out of the fact that. I didn't believe hell was eternal punishment. Hell was just a place where you, you'll burn in the fire for a second, and then it just like you cease to exist. Which I got so many things I could say about that, but I had to decide like, is there is this worth going down that road, or should I just try to keep preaching the gospel? And uh, and but man, there's so much in the Bible that talks about that. And so he was talking about like, well, uh, you know, he was making a difference between life and death, and so obviously they're dead, and so they couldn't really feel the fire and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, I was talking about the, the like all of everyone's dead before they get saved. And your soul's still there, you're still present, but but spiritually speaking, like you're dead, and there's some that are going to be dead for all eternity. Like you know, it doesn't make sense in our in our minds where we're in this physical. Uh, body, but here he says that, that they shall never see life. Never see life, you know, because only the Son of God can give uh, eternal life. But he says the wrath of God abideth on them, okay? So, like, that's going to be, the Bible describes it as eternal torment, and uh, the worm dieth not, and the fire's not quenched, and, and uh, there's torment day and night. I mean, it's pretty specific on that. But anyway, I just thought I'd bring that, that great verse, uh, you know, just kind of reiterate that again. A wonderful verse to memorize. Okay, so. But what I want to talk about, and this is in the passage, we'll read it again. What I want to talk about starting in verse 22 is where uh, the focus is on John the Baptist for a minute. But that's not really the focus of the story. The focus of the story is on those people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, but it's, it's using John the Baptist in this story. And I want to make the application in this message about how we are uh, serving the Lord and we are have a relationship with the Lord similar to what John the Baptist's relationship was and and so uh, let me just, by way of introduction, ask a few questions here about how are we like John the Baptist in this story? Well, first of all, we're Baptists, right? <laughs> we're Baptists. I, uh, driving on the way up here, if you ever have to drive down 169 and you go past Greeley, uh, there's, a, there's a church right on the side and it says, St. John the Baptist Catholic Church. And I'm just like, that's so confusing, man. He's a Baptist. He's not a Catholic. St. <laughs> John the Baptist Catholic Church, right? Now, I know that's not implied like with the word Baptist. It's not just saying, uh, you know, like we think of Baptist today. Uh, but still, we're Baptists. Now, John the Baptist w preached, his baptism was one of repentance. Okay, and I'm not going to get into that real deep right now. Uh, but he was calling the uh, the Is Israelites, you know, he was calling them to announce to them that the Messiah had come, and he was he was pointing them to Jesus as Jesus made his public ministry, and he was calling the nation to repentance. and And there's a lot that I could say right there, but um, but our job is the same as John's was in the sense that he's pointing them to Jesus, saying, "Here is Jesus." And we, as Baptists, believe it or not, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. You know, what makes somebody a Baptist? There's a lot of little distinctives people have put together and said, like, well, if you believe all these things, you're a Baptist. I'll just make it real easy. If we, if we baptize believers, like true believers, we're Baptists, okay? If we teach that their baptism has nothing to do with their salvation whatsoever, and, and we base that off of the authority of Scripture alone, 
we're probably Baptist. If you find a church that has, says, hey, the, I don't believe in any other man's writings, I just believe what the, uh, what the Word of God says, that's my final authority, you know, you say, well, I'm talking to a, a Protestant then, obviously, because they don't believe in the, what the popes and the fathers, uh, past fathers say or whatever. They believe in the Bible, so they're Protestant. Yeah, but it goes a little further because we believe that based on the Bible, it says that, hey, baptism has nothing to do with salvation, and we only baptize believers. Most Protestants baptize infants. Okay, that's contrary to what Scripture teaches. So we teach believers' baptism. So if you got someone that says, Bible's a final authority, you know, we only baptize believers, and, we, and you know, obviously that's, you're going to kind of understand what baptism, I mean, what believers means, you know, if you're baptizing them at that, at that stage, and that has nothing to do with their salvation, you're probably talking to someone who's a Baptist. Now, a lot of times you'll be out soul, soul winning, and you'll find somebody who's saved, and they understand all this, and they, they believe all this, and they'll say, like, well, actually, our church is non-denominational, or our church is a Bible church, or our church is... But if you follow the history, a lot of times they'll say, like, well, it used to be a Baptist church, and then they just dropped the name, and now it's non-denominational or something. Look, that those are Baptistic teachings. Those are Baptist teachings. Like, uh, we're not Protestants, but that's a whole other message for another day. Uh, we are trusting those pretty simple now they're obviously as this church independent fundamental Baptist like there's a lot more things that we we put a lot of emphasis on from God's word uh, but those are the big things that make us Baptist and those are the things that John the Baptist was also about okay so <clears throat> here are some things that we as Baptists today or really let me just say as, as true Bible believing Christians today here are some things that are similar by application uh, to John the Baptist and so in this story, I'm going to point these out. Okay, so number one is this, and these points aren't going to flow really smoothly. This morning I got to preach a alliterated, everything started with S, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I don't, today is not like that, so you're just going to have to follow along, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll get something for ourselves out of this. Okay, number one, every person we get saved is baptized unto Jesus, not unto ourselves. Okay, and let me read the story here and uh, get a little bit of uh, background on what we're talking about. Verse 22, John 3, 22. And these, uh, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. By the way, he didn't have to sprinkle, right? I mean, they weren't sprinkling because why would you need much water to sprinkle somebody? <laughs> so anyway, a lot of the t every time the Bible talks about baptism, there's much water, and they go down into the water. So anyway, I don't have to make that's another Baptist thing, okay? We uh, and I'll get to that here in a minute. But anyway, uh, uh, John is is here and he's baptizing, and then there's also Jesus and his disciples are baptizing, and it says then there arose a question between some of the John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness and, uh, that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. And then he goes on and says a lot of things that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, but I want to point out here, that look, John the Baptist, his whole bap the, the whole reason he's baptizing people is because Jesus had came. Jesus had presented himself, his public ministry began, and he was now, John the Baptist now, just like Malachi had prophesied, pointing people to this Messiah who has now come into the world. And today it's the same thing. When we baptize somebody, well, let me just say, when we get somebody saved, okay, baptism follows, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. When we get somebody saved, they are baptized into Christ, okay? They're not baptized into the church necessarily. Now, we do practice baptism, and we do accept a membership in our church. So like That's the, kind of the way that our, our, we govern ourselves in this church. But look, when we get somebody saved and we get somebody baptized, it's, it's unto the Lord. It's not unto this particular body. Like It's, it's, it's into, Christ, uh, uh, into Christ. So look at John chapter 6. We'll be back in John uh, 3. But go to, uh, I think I said John, Re Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, 
by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. No, let's see here. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, yeah. Yeah, okay. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation whereof ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the part I want to focus on. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, that one baptism, what does that mean? What is there one baptism? One well, in the context, just like there's one God and there's one faith, one baptism means this, that when we put our faith in that God, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, look, we're all putting our faith in the same person, Jesus Christ. We're baptized into Christ. Baptism means immersion, right? So when we baptize somebody, that's why by definition, we take them inside the water, underneath the water, because they're immersed. And when we are immersed in Christ or baptized into Christ, it just means that in salvation, like we are in Christ. We're totally trusting Him. We're totally surrounded by Him. Just like He said in John uh, 10, you know, I am in, you're in my hand and no man can pluck you out of my hand. My Father's greater than I and no man can pluck you out of my Father's hand. Like we are in Christ when we put our faith in Him. And so baptism then of water is a picture. And the Bible is clear on this many times. It's just a picture of what happened when we got saved and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so that just to follow that picture, just like Romans 6 says, we are buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in newness of life, just like, uh, uh, just like Jesus, by example, you know, has set before us. Okay, So when we, uh, you know, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are all, every single one of us, no matter what church in this whole world, does this and, and practice this and preaches the gospel and leads somebody to Christ, they're putting their faith in that same Christ. Okay, now why is that important? Well, I've been preaching a lot about the New Testament church, and I made it very clear from the beginning that we, we believe in local churches. Okay, we don't have this universal church mentality where we're all just part of the, the invisible church or all these type of teachings that are out there. We believe in local churches like we govern this church here, you know, I've, I, as a pastor, I'm given a responsibility to hold the church to a certain standard and discipline people if they, if, if they get out of line in a certain way. It only makes sense that I can do that if this, these people are part of this body, okay, this, this membership. But we also understand that we're, but we're, we're pointing people to not Pastor Rocky. You know, I'm, I'm not here, like, baptizing people and getting into the church and joining this membership so they could be disciples of of Brother Rocky. Now, I am teaching you the Bible. I'm teaching you what Jesus says, but you're baptized into Christ, okay? And you're, and you're, you're followers of Christ, not me. And so, uh, and so, like, we do believe in local churches, uh, but one day, one day, all of us are going to live forever for eternity, you know, as saved people. So, you know, this is why it's so important, man. Why would you hate your brothers? Uh, it's, it's common for Christians to not get along and they hate each other. And it's like, dude, you're going to live for eternity <laughs> with each other. You know, just, just why don't you learn right now to, to love one another and get along. We are one in Christ. We are we come together in Christ. So the water baptism is just a ceremonial thing that pictures the fact that we're in Christ. We, we're buried with him and we're raised with him. Okay, so when Jesus started his public ministry, you know, he had now... People who were following him, which is what John the Baptist was pointing them to do, right? But now, all of a sudden, uh, there were some people who got a little uh, upset about this and said, "I don't understand. Like, wait a minute, John. All these guys are following Jesus now, and they're and they're being baptized unto Jesus." Well, what they should have done is what John did. Look at Ma uh, Matthew chapter three. They should have felt this way anyway. They might not have understood what baptism was all about, but when they but when, when Jesus comes up to John and says, you know, hey, I, I need to be baptized, John's like, what in the world? How could I baptize you? So John, and obviously Jesus didn't need to repent, right? We talked about John's baptism was one of repentance. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 13. 
Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to baptize him. And look at John's response. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to, fu to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw a Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. A low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All right, so what we see here uh, is that Jesus began his public ministry, and he comes to John and says, Okay, you're here to introduce me. You're here to point to you know, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And so now I want you to baptize me. And, of course, he sets an example. Later on, he tells uh, his church, his, the, the early church there, he says, Hey, go out, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy, Holy Ghost. Okay, but obviously there were some guys that were still getting baptized by John that weren't understanding this. They, they, you know, obviously Acts chapter, I mean, John, uh, what we read in our passage talks about that a little bit. Uh, but obviously there are some people who aren't getting this. And as you go into the book of Acts, go over to the book of Acts chapter 19. Even in Paul's day, there were still some Jews that were running around with the, not understanding that Jesus had come and that Jesus is the one that they're supposed to be following. So Acts 19, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Upon what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. And then Paul, uh, uh, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ, on Christ Jesus. Uh, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So somehow they were still baptized, thinking that their baptism was unto John. You know, Now this is important when we're talking about the New Testament church because today a lot of people think that they're baptized into a church. They're baptized into the Roman Catholic Church or they're baptized into, you know, so when at one time, uh, well actually we were visiting some uh, bus kids that we had back, visiting their parents and I'm trying to get the gospel to him and find out where he is on that subject and, and so we start talking about his background and he's like well I'm about a 16th part Methodist and a 16th part Lutheran and a 16th part and I'm like what are you talking about well he was saying that his mom was baptized into the Methodist church and his dad was baptized into the, some other church and so he just is thinking this is like passed down to your children and so like a 16th of him just kind of like like race you know DNA is passed down and I try to show him like hey man that's that's not how it works <laughs> okay but there's a lot of people out there that think that when you're baptized you're baptized into like a denomination and I've had people say that too like you know well I was baptized in the such and such church, but now I want to be baptized a Baptist. And I'm like, well, that's not, that's not really how it works, okay? So when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. Now, here's the thing that we need to know. We need to make sure that if somebody was baptized before they believed in Jesus Christ, well, then, yeah, for sure, we want to ceremonially baptize them again after they believed because it didn't mean anything the first time. They didn't know what they were doing. So now that they put their faith in Jesus Christ, yeah, we'll baptize them as a symbol public display of what they put their faith in Jesus Christ uh, but obviously it's the believing in Jesus Christ that saves them we're just doing the rest to follow Jesus in uh, in obedience okay so I'm not so sure uh, that John even understood exactly what was going on uh, he just knew that hey uh, yeah Jesus is is the one that I'm supposed to be here to point people to but I don't think he completely understood uh, because later on he's in prison and he's even scratching his head wondering some things himself about whether or not this was the Messiah, okay? But anyway, the first point was that every person who's baptized, and I'm talking about baptized, is, is, is baptized into Christ, not unto us, not to a particular church or a denomination or anything like that. They're baptized into Christ. And so this is what we see. Go back to John chapter 3. That's the first part that I want you to notice when you're reading this. <clears throat> and these guys didn't understand that. And I don't even know to what extent John the Baptist did, 
But his answer is, is great. Of course, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but his, his answer to them is like, hey, I, you're witnesses that I've been saying I'm not the Christ that should come. And so this is the Christ that should come, so of course they're supposed to be following him. That's basically what he says. So go to uh, verse uh, 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness, and I said, I am not the, the Christ, uh, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy there. Uh, this my joy there, uh, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I'll talk about that verse in a minute. Okay, so the second thing I want you to see this is uh, by the title of the message. We are the friends of the bridegroom. Just like John the Baptist is friends of the bridegroom. Let's say he's like the, the friend of the bridegroom. His job is to stand by the bridegroom, to witness what the bridegroom is doing, to encourage him, to share in that joy, and to be a witness and, and to be part of what he's doing. And this is what John the Baptist is saying. Like, hey, don't freak out because, you know, Jesus is having people baptized unto him, which by the way, you can go into the next verse, chapter, I mean, the next chapter. And it actually shows you there in verse 2 that Jesus himself wasn't actually baptizing these people. His disciples were. But it was understood that they're, they're baptizing them to follow Jesus. And so this was confusing the, uh, these people. Why are they baptizing people instead of John baptizing people? Uh, but Jesus himself wasn't baptizing anybody, which I think is really interesting because the same thing is said about Paul. You know, Paul at one point is talking about salvation. He says, like, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you guys. And then he starts remembering some people that he did baptize, you know, like, except him and him and him. <laughs> you know, but the idea that like, he was making a pretty, pretty neat point that, you know, all these people that think baptism is required for salvation, well, then why wasn't Jesus baptizing people? Why wasn't Paul focused on baptizing people? He's like, man, I'm just preaching Jesus Christ. And, I, and obviously people were following up and they were baptizing believers, but he's like, I am just, you know, I'm just worried about making sure that they put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first and foremost thing. Okay, so, uh, but anyway, we are supposed to be doing the same thing because we are friends of the bridegroom. Now, it's hard to imagine that Jesus would even call us friends, uh, but the Bible makes it clear. I, I mentioned this in this morning's message you know, there are times where men of God are called the friend of God, like Abraham was called the friend of God. Uh, Moses, God said, I, I speak to him face to face as a man speaketh to a friend. Jesus here is talking to his disciples, and he's like, hey, you are my friends. Now, obviously, he just got done saying, uh, no man, uh, no greater love hath this, this than a man lay down his life for his friends, which is what Jesus did for us. So there's no doubt about this. Jesus was a friend to all of us, to, to the whole world. He was a friend. But how are we a friend to him? Well, he says, like, ye are my friends if you keep my commandments. Okay, so if we're living for him and we're, we're serving him and we're trying to bring glory to him, then we're his friend, just like John the Baptist is his friend. And this is our job to, uh, to, to point people to the one who is the bridegroom. Okay, look at, uh, let's see, how far did I read? Uh, chapter 3, well, anyway. Uh, isn't it, here's what I want to point out. You've been, we've all been to weddings. Weddings can sometimes be stressful. Everybody admit that. <laughs> like sometimes they can be, uh, they can be kind of hard depending on the, all the, the players involved, you know, but I tell you what I find sickening, right? And whenever I have, uh, performed, I've only performed two weddings and one, one wasn't very public. It was just with a handful of people. Uh, but, but anyway, I made it very clear from the beginning, like, hey, this wedding is all about the bride and the groom, okay? Have you ever been to a wedding where everybody else wants to make it about them? It's like they, they want a dress. Man, uh, you know, I, I heard a story, um, you know, I, I've heard stories of, like, somebody showing up with a dress that's, like, f fancier than the bride or something like that. And it's just like, what, what are you doing? You know, uh, there are times people want everybody to see their clothes and, and their outfit and like they're on display they want you know they're being chaperoned by somebody they want them to see their you know relationship with this uh, this beautiful couple or whatever and it's like it's not your wedding it's not your day why are you doing that if somebody's asked to sing a special and you just got this feeling like they're just like pushing everybody out of the way like hey now everybody watch me sing the special and it's like 
you know, get a little bit lower and point the, the glory onto the bride and the groom because this is their special day, you know. But I've been to that. I've been there lots of times. I've heard a lot of preachers say that they, even when things are getting set up, hey, don't try to have the wedding run the way that you want the wedding to be. This isn't your wedding. This is their wedding. Let them uh, be the ones who have it their way and they get the, the, the glory. And so our job, just like the friend of the bridegroom, okay, or you would say the best man, okay, our job is to stand with him, to be a witness with him, to rejoice with him as we bring, pre bring people to Christ. Okay, and the last point is this. He says in that verse, he must increase, verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, that was a beautiful thing said by John. And it was something that I believe came from the heart. I believe he was very right. He is a friend of the bridegroom. He doesn't want the glory and all that. But go to Luke chapter 7. And I kind of mentioned this a minute ago. Luke chapter 7. And uh, let's see here. Let's go to verse, well, I'm going to end up being at verse 28, but let's go to, let's go to verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departing, no, no, see, i got to back up. Uh, let's go to verse 19. And John calling unto, his two, unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another. Now, that's so weird. In fact, very sad to hear come out of John's mouth because you're like, hey, this is the man that's pointing everybody to Jesus. This is the man that when they're like, hey, Jesus is baptizing more people than, than you. He's like, hey, I must increase. He must decrease. Like, it's all about him. Like, he's the one that's to come. I'm nobody, basically. But see, now he's in jail and he's scratching his head thinking like, well, hey, wait a minute, I thought we were setting up this kingdom and Jesus is going to rule and reign over his kingdom. And I don't understand being persecuted. I don't understand why we're not taking up swords and fighting. Why am I in jail? And so he has some moments of doubt because things didn't turn out the way that he wanted to. And he said, Jesus, is he the one or should we look for another? What's going on? And so the rest of the story plays out really cool because Jesus is going to allow him to kind of eat, eat his words and, and eat some humble pie. Okay. He says, uh, and this, and this, let me see, uh, where'd I leave off? Verse 20, when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of, uh, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised uh, to the poor. The gospel is preached, and blessed, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Okay, so he's telling them, hey, go show him what's done, and then say, blessed is he that shall not be offended in me. Now let's go on. Verse 24, and when the messengers of John were departed, okay, so he's, John doesn't get to hear this message. Yeah, man, I don't know what the guys and uh, all these men in the Bible, great men of God who's, who have these wonderful stories written about them. You kind of wonder how they, you know, how they get to hear that in heaven. But, uh, but there's witness of all these accounts that's written in the Bible. John doesn't get to hear this, but here's what Jesus says about John. The messengers of John were departed. He began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are in gorgeous apparel, uh, are gorgeous apparel and live delicately are in king's courts. But went, what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the, thy way before thee. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women, there is none, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Let's just stop right there for a second and say, like, can you imagine that being said about you? <laughs> Among, you know, men or women born of a woman, there's not been somebody greater than 
I mean, man, I know that would never be said of me, so I'm not worried about it. But it's just like, can you imagine what an honor? Now, John didn't even get to hear this. John's sitting in prison thinking, like, I did all this. I mean, I've been eating locusts and honey for all these years of preaching about Jesus, and, and now I'm sitting in prison. But see, he's the one that said, he must increase, I must decrease. But now when he's act, it actually happens, and he's decreased, and he's humbled, is he has a hard time understanding this. Okay, but here's what Jesus says as he goes on. He's like, man, there's none greater on this earth than John the Baptist. Man, he's just a wonderful guy. He's a great guy. He says this, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, this is an interesting, this is an interesting story to me. Okay, because here's what I think is being said. Who cares how great you are on this earth? Who cares what great accomplishments you've done for the Lord? At the end of the day, you're going to die, and you're going to go into a box, and you're going to be buried six feet on the ground. You know, look at, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And look at verse 4. Ecclesiastes 9, 4. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> Lions are way better than dogs, okay? I don't know if there's dog people in here, and sorry to offend you. I'm not a cat person, but lions, yeah, lions going to beat a dog any day, okay? <laughs> but here's the deal. If the lion's dead, it's, it's not really of any value, right? Uh, 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 if, if a dog is alive, it's better than a dead, is that, is that how he says it? Uh, he says, uh, I lost my verse again, verse 4, he says, uh, oh man, I'm in the wrong place, okay. He says, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Here's what I think the Lord is saying about John the Baptist. Hey, he's a great man. He's great, but he's a human man. And, he, and he's on earth, like he's thinking about the physical things on earth. Like, when's this kingdom going to be set on earth? When am I going to get out of jail? When am I going to have things go my way? And Jesus is saying, you know what? He that's least in God's kingdom is greater than him. You know, I don't care how great you think you are of a person. Oh, I've done all these great things for the Lord. You know, hey, look how many people I've won for the Lord. Hey, look what Iola Baptist Temple did last week. We brought... Almost 20 people, man, if, 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 if we would have had one more soul winner come out, we would have broke 20 probably. <laughs> Almost had 20 people get saved last week. And we can start glorifying ourselves and saying how we're doing the work of God so, so good. And then whenever things don't happen, like, okay, here's what happened to me. Okay, great day. Uh, go out on a high. Like this week has been so great, uh, so happy about all this. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm supposed to get this apartment cleaned, okay? Not this apartment, but this office cleaned. I'm supposed to, I, I do a little cleaning job on the side. And so it's out in Parsons. And I'm like, well, you know, I can be thinking about my message and doing some work on that as I drive out there. And I'm going to drive out there, and then, uh, and then I'll come back and get things finished up for, for church in the morning. And so I drove out, you know, the end of the week. We had a great week, right? And then I go, and, uh, and, uh, and I take the, my key card, and I get ready to go clean the building. And it goes, beep, and it's locked. Beep. I drove all the way out to Parsons. My key card didn't even work. I tried to get a hold of the people. They didn't answer. And I'm like, well, what can I do? I wasted a trip out here. I wasted the time, wasted the gas money. I'll just go home. And on my way home, a deer, tis the season, jumps in front of me. <laughs> Smack. M messes the, the front end of, my, uh, of the Suburban up. Just bust the thing. It could have been a lot worse. I mean, we totaled a 15-passenger van with a deer that ran... This deer was a mighty deer. It's like you ever heard of Mighty Mouse back in the day? This is this deer, man. It just ran right into the corner of a to the corner of a 15 passenger van and demolished it. It's like it was totaled. Okay, the suburban is not too bad, but I'm like, oh great! Like what a great. Now I really did, I felt pretty good about it because because it was just like a spiritual high, and I'm just like, ah, who cares? <laughs> but I could have very easily been like, why God? I'm going out doing all this stuff in your name and and doing all these wonderful works. Why would something bad happen to me? Well, here's why. Because you're just a human. I mean, you're just like a, you're, you're a dead lion. <laughs> you know, who cares? Now, now, obviously, we're going to heaven one day. And so, like, our souls are precious, you know. But on this earth, like, who cares? You know, our entire 
existence on this earth, since you've been saved, like you have a purpose. Like if you didn't have any purpose in, in this life, well, why wouldn't God just take you straight to heaven? And you say, like, okay, well, hey, you're saved now. Why don't you enjoy the, your, your kingdom? No, he leaves us on this earth to, en to endure tribulations and trials and struggles and all this stuff. You know, and, and, and in the meantime, we're trying to bring people to him and trying to get people saved. And it's like, hey, those people that we get saved, that's what it's all about. Who cares if we have to suffer? Who cares if we have to be a little bit poor or we have to go through some tough times or whatever? We're trying to get people saved because that eternal life that's going to heaven is way more valuable than my life on this earth. And so we are trying to bring people to heaven. Now, our life is valuable in the sense that we have eternal life because we receive Jesus Christ. But there's all these people that don't. And if we get focused on the things of this earth, thinking, you know, hey, you know, yeah, I know I should go to church right now, but. You know, I really got to do this, this thing. Now, sometimes you have, that comes up, I understand, you, you, and, you, and you're without a choice. But, you know, so many times we make the decision to follow our, our own desires or to follow our own needs and wants and, uh, and leave beside doing the work of the Lord. And the Bible makes it very clear, like, whenever you do that, you're choosing the wrong path, okay? <laughs> because the Bible says that if we will uh, uh, focus on righteousness, you know, then he will give us everything that we need to continue doing the work for him. I'm not worried about the suburban. I mean, it's a church is suburban, so I'm really, <laughs> I'm really not at a loss anyway. But, uh, but I'm not worried about that. You, can, I, can I tell you the story about the suburban? Okay, after we busted that 15 passenger van, or after that deer, mighty deer, came and, and totaled our 15 passenger van, <clears throat> Brother ES said, "You know what? There's a guy that's selling a." Uh, Oh, he has a suburban. He wasn't even, he didn't even have it up for sale. He's like, I know a guy has a suburban. He's not using it. I'm going to ask him if it's for sale. It ended up being pretty good condition. You're, you're a mechanic. It's, it's a pretty sound vehicle, right? And it's been, okay, so anyway, so we got it. It was like $3,000. It was a great deal for it. But, you know, our church doesn't have a lot of money. And I, I went ahead and wrote it. I said, okay, I know that's a kind of big expense, but I mean, $3,000. No, no, I'm sorry, $4,000. $4,000 for a, you know, a, Fairly new. I mean, it's in good shape. You can look at it now, and it's not in good shape, but it was in good shape when we bought it. $4,000, right? I didn't have it for one week, and I'm going to make a deposit at the bank, and this lady's not paying attention. She's looking down, and she, and she hits the, the, the back end by the, by the gas can, right? One of the smaller dents now, but at the time, <laughs> the only dent on the whole thing. And she hits the back of it, and I was like, oh, man, just got this thing, and, and we'll see what, what happens. So we turn into the insurance and all this stuff. Long story short, they total out the van for this little bitty dent. They total out the van, and then they sell it back to us for, I don't know, $500 or something like that. And, uh, and they basically, they gave us a, uh, the insurance money for that was like $3,000. And so like the, the, you know, total the 15 passenger van, oh no, we don't have the money, what are we gonna do? I basically get another vehicle for $500 or $1,000, <laughs> okay, is what it comes out to. And so like, am I worried about that Suburban? It's just a thing, it's just a, a vehicle that gets me from Iola to here two times a week, <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's nothing. But in our life, so many times, we're just like, no, I need more things. And oh, how many times do you hear someone say, oh, life is short. You got to get all that you can. I'm like, well, that's a stupid way to look at it. Because if life's so short and tomorrow you just, you, you just die, you know, what did all those things that you spent your whole life gathering? It meant nothing. You know, what we need to put our, our value in is what Jesus said. Hey, lay up your treasures in heaven, fruit for the Lord. And when you bring somebody to Christ, you know, that is an eternal soul now saved, now part of the kingdom. So our job, let me just conclude this here. Quickly. Our job as Baptists, right? Our job as disciples of Christ, our job as members of Iola Baptist Temple is to glorify the bridegroom. Now, again, I know that we, can, we are part of the bride, if you will. We are going to inherit that that blessing. But on this earth, as we're working for the Lord, you know what? We're just friends of the bridegroom. We're trying to contribute to his glory, tr contribute to that wonderful wedding day in heaven and, and contribute to that. We are to take a back seat to the glory that he deserves. We're to take a back seat to that. Yes, we're going to enjoy heaven, but when it comes to service, we need to be friends of the bridegroom. It's all about him. He must increase we must decrease. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us as a church to serve you and you continue to supply for our needs. Now, yeah, there's times that we struggle in different areas 
and we might wonder if things are going the way that they should go, Lord. But when we just seek first uh, righteousness, um, you just give us everything that we need to be able to keep doing your work and to survive and to be happy and to uh, just go on our merry way, Lord. So I pray that you help us not to get distracted with the things of this world, not to get distracted uh, by trying to seek our own glory and our own fame and, and own recognition. But I pray, Lord, that you'll help us set all that aside and realize that all that is just like a dead lion. It means nothing. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'll just help us remember why we're here and, uh, and, and point all the glory, just like John the Baptist was supposed to do, point all the attention and the glory to Jesus Christ. I pray you help us in Jesus' name. Amen.